come back. Amen. We need to go to God in prayer. So, friends, let's pray and let's ask God to be with us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much again, Lord, for waking us up this morning, breathing your breath of life into us again. Lord, as we study the subject of the rapture, study the topic of a thief in the night and what that really means, Lord, I pray, God, that you will give us understanding. Lord, we, we live in times of deception, times where every wind of doctrine is blowing about in the world. Lord, anyone that gets on the Internet nowadays are so confused. They don't know what to believe. They don't know what to think. But, Lord, I pray, God, that you will call us all back to your word, that we will not go to any men's opinions or any uh, philosophies or any, any ideologies of the last days, but, Lord, that we will go to you and your word and draw our strength from that. So, Father, tonight, please give us understanding. And, Lord, help us to take what we understand and apply to our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thief in the night. Thief in the night. How many of you have ever heard of this very popular television series that came out in the 80s, late 80s to early 90s called Left Behind? Anyone ever heard of this? Raise your hand if you heard of this. Yes, Left Behind. This was a very, very popular television program that came out. It also started as a series of books uh, as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But this movie, this series of movies, uh, is just starring, as you can see, Brother Kirk Cameron's on the screen here. Uh, this came out in the late 80s, early 90s, and it took the world by storm. These movies uh, were based off of the books that was one of the New York Times best-selling novels. And uh, people were buying these books and buying these movies and watching them. And I remember growing up in the, in the 90s, uh, there was churches that were meeting in flocks and herds. And they would come together and they would watch these movies. And these movies were portraying a very interesting um, teaching, a very interesting viewpoint about the rapture, about the second coming of Jesus. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the term rapture? Now, that is not a term that's actually found in the Bible. The term rapture is not actually found in the Bible. But what you do find in the Bible is the word caught up, which that's kind of what rapture means, to be caught up, right? And so uh, while the word rapture is not found in the Bible, we know the term caught up is found in the Bible. And that's kind of where that term comes from. But this series of, of, of movies and this series of novels that were written were uh, written by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And... Uh, you'll see uh, they made a movie back in 2014 uh, with even Nicolas Cage and, uh, called Left Behind. And it was based off of the old movies that Kirk Cameron starred in. And how many of you ever get a chance to see any of these movies? Anyone? Yes, a couple of us. Okay, yeah. Well, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, they wrote these, these series of novels uh, titled Left Behind. And what these, what these uh, new movies and these novels were about was about showing how these characters we're having to fight through and make it through the last days. And how it kind of starts off in the movie is that it shows that these people are in an airplane. And Brother Kirk Cameron and some of the other people are on this airplane with them. And they're up in the sky flying at 33,000 feet. And uh, as they're flying in this airplane, they all kind of, you know, it's dark and it's late at night. They're all kind of sleeping. Well, um, Kirk Cameron gets up to use the bathroom. And as he's getting up to use the bathroom, this old woman stops him. And she says, oh, honey. She says, could you go and check to see if my husband is in the bathroom? And he says, well, yes, ma'am. She said, he's been in there for a while, and I'm worried about him. And um, he says, yes, ma'am, I sure do that. She says, oh, honey, can, can you please take this to him? And she hands him his clothes. His clothes were laying there. And this movie goes on to say that, 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 they had, that Jesus Christ's second coming had, had happened, and the rapture had taken place. Now, the rapture, as it taught in this series of novels, in this series of movies, was, was the secret, silent catching away of God's children. That Jesus' second coming had appeared, and, and how you knew it appeared is that there was clothes just left behind, and, and all these people were vanished, they were gone. Uh, the movie goes on to portray how, how there's people all over this plane, and, and there's just clothes just laying everywhere in the seats, and... People are, are, are on the streets and their clothes are just laying there. and There's, there's, there's no one there. It's just clothes. Uh, they would go to walk their dog and, and then poof, old Rocky's left behind with no one to take care of him anymore. And people were just really perplexed by this teaching and by this vanishing and the catching away or this rapture of God's people. And I remember growing up in the early 90s and I was seeing this teaching and seeing how people were, were going on and on about this and people all over the world were telling people that this is really how it's going to happen. That when Jesus Christ comes back a second time, that they're going to be raptured 
out of here. They're going to be secretly and silently poofed out of here. And they will go to live with God in heaven. And the teaching goes on to say that those who wasn't raptured, that they were left behind, hence the name of the series, left behind, that they would be left behind for the seven years of tribulation. Now, does that sound familiar to anyone? Seven years of tribulation, yes. Secret, silent rapture. This is a teaching that about 95 to 98% of the Christian churches today teach and believe in, dealing, about, dealing with the second coming of Jesus. But friends, I want to share with you that I don't believe this teaching. I believe that the Bible communicates something very, very different. And as I was raised up in the, in the, in the 90s, uh, you know, seeing this and seeing all of this movement, how big it was and how everyone was going on and on about it, you know, it just, it, there was so many questions that I had, so many things that just didn't quite make sense to me. But as I got old enough and I started reading my Bible and I started studying the Bible and seeing what the Bible had to say about the second coming of Jesus Christ, I was like, wow, I don't see any of the secret, silent catching away that everyone else talked about. I didn't see any seven years of tribulation that everyone else talked about. I didn't see any of that. And as I studied my Bible, I searched earnestly because I was raised in churches that taught this and believed this the majority of my life. And I had to ask myself a question. Can I find it in the Bible? And as I said before, as I searched, I couldn't find it. And so, friends, Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. He said, and, he said, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. When Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote their series of books titled Left Behind, they wrote them as novels. Now, as novels, are they fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. They're fiction. By definition, novels are fiction. They are not nonfiction. Now, if you don't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction, fiction means it's, it's not real. Isn't that right? Nonfiction means it's real. Isn't that right? Amen. It's a real thing that you can bank on. Now, when Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote this, they were written as novels, but yet the entire Christian world began to actually buy into this teaching of this secret silent rapture catching away and all of this stuff. And it took the world literally by storm. They sold millions upon millions upon millions of copies of their, their books, and even millions upon millions upon millions of copies of the DVDs that were made. And to this day, like I said, Christianity has been plagued with this teaching, and plagued with this false teaching about the second coming of Jesus that is just wrong. And um, I normally would play a, a film, or play a clip of the film of Left Behind to give you an idea, but I'd rather not take my time up showing you something false. Most of you, if you've already heard of this teaching, or if you watch the movies, you already know what I'm talking about. You know what it teaches. So let's test this teaching according to the Bible. What do you say? Amen. Let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Now, what I would like to cover real quickly is that we just talked about before, that was the children of Israel ready for Jesus' first coming? Yes or no? No. In fact, they totally missed out on it. Now, here are some reasons for the false teaching concerning Jesus' first coming. Number one, the people were not studying God's Word for themselves. Can you say amen? If they would have been studying the Bible for themselves, they could have read in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and they could have gotten an exact time frame when to expect Jesus Christ on the scene. That prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 told them exactly when, we're going to study that prophecy in the future, told them exactly when they should be expecting the Messiah. But now here comes Jesus, the Messiah. He's come before their eyes. He's looking at them in the eye. Have mercy. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. And they didn't get it. It went right through one ear and right out the other ear. And so, friends, because of this teaching that had crept in the, the, the society's mindset in Jesus' day, there was a whole lot of deceptions going on because of these false teachings. People put their trust and religious leaders of the day. They, they wasn't studying the Bible for themselves. That was their first problem, and they were putting their trust in religious leaders of the day. They were trusting the priests and the high priests and, and the scribes and the Pharisees and all these high individuals in the church. And, and, you know, today, you know what I hear more than anything? I hear people saying, Oh, well, Pastor Bob's a good man. 
And Pastor Bob, I was raised up with Pastor Bob. You know, me and him, we went to gym class together. And, and me and Pastor Bob, we were good buddies all the way through high school. And we even went to college together. And, and Pastor Bob's my next door neighbor. And, you know, I, he helps watch my house when I'm gone on vacation sometimes. And, and so because of their relationship with somebody, they start putting their trust in that person. Should we trust people with our lives when it comes to life and death? No. There's too much at stake, friends. There is too much at stake here. We do not need to be putting our trust in religious leaders. Have mercy. We need to be putting our trust in the Word of God. Amen. And there's too many people not doing that in the days that we're living in. And so today we see that same problem still ringing true in our society. I have people say that to me all the time. They'll say that... that uh, you know, my pastor's a good man. I know my pastor wouldn't lie to me, and there's, he wouldn't tell me something false. It's not, I know my Bible, I know what the Bible says, here's the scripture, here's why I believe what I believe. You don't hear that. It said, I know my pastor. I know my deacon. I know the elders of my church. Friends, that's a dangerous mindset. That's what got the children of Israel in trouble to cause them to miss out on Jesus' first coming. So, we need to be like the Bereans. How many of you have studied the Bereans in the Bible? You've seen that, remember the story of the Bereans? In Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas were going to go to Berea and meet the Bereans and preach the word to them. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures how often? daily to see whether those things were what? So, this wasn't just your, your people who say, oh, well, Brother Paul's coming to preach to us. Well, I don't need to bring my, my Bible to Sabbath school this, this week because Brother Paul won't lead me astray. They didn't say that, did they? They didn't say, oh, well, Brother Silas is coming. We can trust Brother Silas. I don't need to bring my Bible and check him. Did they say that? They search the Scriptures, how often? Daily, Daily friends, to see whether they, those things that Paul and Silas were teaching them were so. Friends, if the Bereans wouldn't trust Paul and Silas, should we trust any man? Absolutely not. You know, and even if my boss, Doug Batchelor, and, and, and some of the greatest ministers of, of our world today were standing up here, I would hope that they would say the same thing. I know my, my boss would. I can't speak for all the other ministers out there, but I know Brother Doug Batchelor would. He would tell us it's too much at stake here to trust men. We must trust God and His Word. So let's look at the, let's ask the question, how will Jesus return? If the secret silent rapture left behind teaching isn't how Jesus is actually going to return, and we're going to make those kind of claims, then we need to be able to prove that according to Scripture. Isn't that right? Amen. Absolutely right. We can't just say somebody's wrong and then not show any proof for why they're wrong. While about 98 to 95 percent of Christians today believe this, we need to be able to prove it wrong, and we need to be able to show it straight from the Bible. So let's go to Acts chapter one, and let's see what happened when Jesus ascended to heaven. It says, "And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and then a cloud received him out of their what, out of their sight." And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. Is that pretty clear? Yes. That's pretty clear. Are they talking about his second coming? Yes. Well, that, what they just experienced was his first coming. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. But now he's going away into heaven, but he told them he's going to come back, did he not? So now these, these men in white apparel are referencing his second return, isn't that right? Yes. Definitely, no doubt about it. And they're saying that this same Jesus whom you're seeing ascending into the clouds shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Now I have a question. In the television series Left Behind, in the books left behind, do we see Jesus literally coming back in the clouds of heaven? Absolutely not. Not at His second coming. Instead, at what they say is the second coming, you see a poof, a, a, a secret silent catching away. You don't physically, literally see Jesus 
coming back in the clouds of heaven. Have mercy. I think of all the people who would have saw him, the people in the plane. I don't know if you've seen the movie. They're up there in the plane. I think the people in the plane would have been the first ones to see Jesus. What, are we, what about you? Amen. They're up there in the plane, above the clouds and above everything. I think they would have saw the bright light of God's glory shining through, those, shining through that airplane. What do you say? Amen. Amen. But you didn't see that. Instead, there was, again, a secret, silent snatching away. Number one, so Christ's coming is a literal what? It's a literal event. These are facts that we're going to go through about Christ's second coming. Number two that we're going to put up on the screen is Christ's coming is a personal event. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Let's look and let's get proof for this. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, In my Father's house are many what? Many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for who? For us. Isn't that right? He's going to prepare a place for us. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be where? Where? Also. So friends, God was going to come again. It was going to be a personal event. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. Amen? So it's a very personal event. I remember my father-in-law, um, not too long ago, we were, uh, we were at his house, and we were visiting with him and his wife, Jenny. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there, and he tells me, he says, all I ask God is that he moves me from a single wide into a double wide. Amen? But you know what Jesus says? That we're going to have many mansions. Amen? But I'm not so concerned about the mansions as much as I am or just about wanting to be around Jesus. What about you? Amen? I don't have to have a mansion. You just put me in the hole in the ground. As long as I get to see Jesus every day, that's all that matters. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. But God loves us so much that He's got wonderful things prepared. You know, the Bible goes on to say that eyes haven't seen nor have ears heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for us. Amen? Friends, I'm looking forward to that day. Number three, Christ's coming is a what? Is a visible event. Now, did the people at Jesus' second coming in the Left Behind series, did they visibly see Jesus come back at His second coming? Do this right here. No, not at all. Not at all. What, what, what they saw was clothes lying on the ground. They didn't see Jesus at all. But let's see what the Bible has to say about Jesus' second coming. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall what? See. Shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so, amen. Was it clear when it said, Every eye shall see Him? Now, what does every eye mean? It means every eye, doesn't it? Amen? So, so, when you read the Left Behind series and you study the Left Behind series, you don't see every eye seeing Jesus. In fact, most of the people don't even know what's happening. They're looking around going, what? Where were they at? And then all chaos starts breaking loose. Now, friends, this is a very dangerous teaching. And I'm going to share with you why this secret silent rapture teaching, this left behind teaching, this seven years of tribulation teaching, I'm going to share with you at the end just why this is such a dangerous teaching. Why, how, it was, how it was founded by the devil himself to create this teaching. Moving on, let's, let's prove more that Jesus Christ's coming is a visible event. Matthew 24 verse 30, it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in where? In heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth, what? Mourn, it says, and they shall, what? See the Son of Man coming in the, what? Clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, what does it mean to see the Son of Man? Is that speaking figuratively or literally? Very literally, amen? No doubt about it. It says that we shall see Him coming where? In the clouds of heaven. Now, what, what did those two men in white apparel say? They said, as you've seen him go away into the clouds, so he shall come in like manner. This is what this scripture is, if re, is referencing, how he's coming back in the clouds. Can you say amen? No doubt about that. So friends, we see the word of God is clear. 
Here's another one in Matthew 24, verse 27. Jesus says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, friends, you could, you could literally be staring away from lightning. Lightning could be happening over here. You could be facing away from lightning and still see the results of the lightning. Isn't that right? You don't even have to be looking directly at it. It could be over there, and you could still see the lightning, the effects of it. Friends, are you going to be able to miss the second coming of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. That wouldn't even make any sense. Jesus is supposed to come back to vindicate who He is to all of the world so that all of the world knows who He is. It would not make sense for it to be some secret, silent rapture as the world is teaching nowadays and the majority of these churches. Let's move on. Let's answer more. Number four, Christ's coming is an audible event. Now, the behind series, did they literally hear Jesus coming back? No, there was nothing. It was a secret, silent event that happened. But look at what the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 31. It says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a what? Trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Can you say amen? amen. This is a literal event. This is an audible event where the trumpets are going to be sounding by the angels of God. 1 Thessalonians goes on to say here in verse 4 and 16, It says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from where? From heaven with a whimper. He's going to be descending with whispering. Is that what it says? With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now, friends, i got a question. Is a trumpet a loud instrument? You better believe it's a loud instrument, amen? A trumpet is a very loud and boisterous instrument. If trumpets that are made by little puny men are loud, what do you think the trump of God is going to sound like? You think that's going to be something quiet? You think it's going to be something secret? Or do you think the whole world is going to hear that trumpet? I think the whole world is going to hear that trumpet. It goes on to say, The dead in Christ shall rise first, which brings us to our next point. Christ's coming brings a what? A resurrection. Check this out. In the same verse that we just read, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, The dead in Christ shall rise when? First, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and then the dead in Christ shall rise first. There is going to be a massive resurrection at the second coming of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Number six, it says, Christ will have all the angels of heaven with Him. Can you say amen to that? Now, keep in mind, all of the angels in heaven will be with Jesus. How do we know that? Matthew 25, verse 31. He says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him. Not only did you not see Jesus in the Left Behind films, you didn't see any of the angels. At the second coming, at this catching away, at this rapture that they speak of. You didn't see none of that, did you? Absolutely not. But it says that when Jesus comes back, every eye will see Him. How can you miss God? Amen? Every eye will see Him, and all the holy angels will be with Him. Now, I don't know about you, if you read Revelation, it says that the angels, it kind of gives this big number. And basically what it means is you can't, you can't count the angels. There's so many. It says that there's ten thousands times ten thousand and thousands of thousands and thousands. In other words, friends, you can't count that. that, that, that so, that's so many angels, you, 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 you couldn't shake a stick, as they say at them. Amen? And so, friends, how are you going to miss that many angels coming back in all of their glory? Does that sound like something secret and silent? No. I don't think so at all. It says, and then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Let's move on. Number seven. Christ's feet will not touch the ground. Can you say amen to that? You see, friends, here's a very great deception with this one. How you distinguish true Christ from false Christ is by this right here. This is one of the great indicators. You see, Jesus' feet is not going to touch this sinful world again until it's made new. 
Now, you say, Dakota, where are you getting that at in the Bible? Well, let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It says, Then we which are alive and remain... So it said the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? So we're going to get to see our loved ones meet Jesus in the air. Can you say amen to that? Amen. What a great and glorious day. I'm looking forward to that day. And as they're meeting Jesus in the air, it says, Then we that are alive to see Jesus' second coming... It says, shall be caught up. There's that term where they get rapture from. We shall be caught up together with them, with our loved ones, in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where? Where's the Lord? In the air. air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, we will go on to be with Jesus in heaven. and, And we'll talk about what happens after that in a further topic. I can't get into that right now. But we will go on to be with Jesus in heaven. Now, check this out. There's a lot of Christians out there today teaching that when Jesus Christ comes back, that He's going to be walking on this earth and He's going to reign here, guess how long? A thousand years. How'd you know? That's the same false teaching that they were teaching back in Jesus' day when He was living. And that's the same teaching why they missed out on Jesus' first coming while they wasn't ready for His first coming, is that they were teaching back in those days that Jesus Christ, the Messiah rather, was going to come, He was going to set up His kingdom on earth, declare independence from Rome, and that He was going to be able to reign on the earth for 1,000 years. Well, hold on a second. The Bible says we're meeting Him in the air. Now, if He's going to come and reign on earth for 1,000 years, why isn't He coming down and, and coming on earth with us? Why are we meeting Him in the air? Are you with me? Are you following me here? So here's the point. This is how you distinguish true from false Christ. There is tons of people. You could, do, you could do research on this if you would like to get a kick out of something. There is tons of people that have, have, have claimed to be miracle workers and they, 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 they do all these crazy miracles and all these crazy signs and they claim that they're Jesus. That they are Jesus Christ manifested in the flesh Right now, there was a, there was a, there's a religion that exists right now. I actually encountered this religion when I was in Hawaii back in January. There was a whole church, huge church, fast growing. There's about three or four million members of, the, of these people. They are literally teaching right now that the Holy Spirit is a woman in South Korea. And they're actually literally teaching that Jesus Christ was born again, was, came back into this earth, was born in the early 1900s and was baptized in 1948. And they've created this whole teaching. And they have millions of followers. If they would just read their Bibles, they would know that their whole, that whole religion is, is false. That whole teaching is false. Can you say amen? Yeah. Friends, this is how we distinguish true Christ from false Christ. Amen? Amen. Matthew 24, verse 23. It says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, what does he say? Believe it not, He says, for there shall arise false what? False Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs. Notice, these false Christs, these false prophets are showing great signs and what? And wonders. You see, we live in a day and age where we're tangible people. If if, if somebody tells us, I can make a flower grow right here, right now. Well, he's like, no, you can't. But what if they did it? That would be a sign and a wonder, would it not? That would be a wonder. You'd be going, oh, whoa. And then, then they go on, they do other things. And then people, that's how they get bought into these deceptions. You know the devil can work miracles too? Yes. Open your Bibles for a moment. Revelation chapter 16. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 14. Revelation chapter 16, and let's look at verse 14. Say a good amen when you're there. It says, for they are the spirits of devils working what? Can devils, you mean to tell me devils can work miracles? Absolutely. The word of God is very clear. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. We'll talk about that coming up. We're going to be talking about the seven last plagues in Revelation 16 at a further topic. But friends... In the last days, people are buying into these deceptions of believing in false Christ and false prophets because they're seeing signs and wonders being worked. 
They're not, a lot of them are just not believing blindly. They've seen things. I've been in churches, let me tell you something, churches that are all about feelings, watch out. Watch out. We should not let our feelings lead us. Can you say amen? We need to be letting the Word of God lead and guide us. I don't care how it feels. You, you know, the devil will make you feel good just to deceive you. People say, well, the devil don't want to make you feel good. He'll make you feel any way you want to feel to get you to buy into a deception. And so people, today, they, they, they get out there and they say, oh, but I felt something good, brother, and I felt this and I felt that. Watch out. Because guess what? What you may have been feeling may have felt real good. You know, people can say cheating on their wife felt real good. Cheating on their husbands felt real good because they didn't like their husband. Their husband did something bad or, or their wife did something bad to them. Felt good to get at them. But let me tell you something. If you don't find that in the Word of God, do away with it. Amen? We need to be sure about our Word and about what we believe. It says, They shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Is it possible for God's elect to be deceived? Yes. Definitely. There is no one in this whole world that is incapable of being deceived. Look at David. David and all of his, and all of his wisdom and all of his knowledge and, 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 and his headship, look at what he ended up doing with Bathsheba. Look at Solomon. Talk about a man of wisdom. Look at where he ended up. Friends, if Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, apart from Jesus, if he can be deceived, we can too. Let us not get ourselves into believing, I'm a part of the elect. I can't be deceived. You know, some people will walk around, they just think they're the, they're, the, they're the most smartest people in the world. Oh, friends, we need to be humble. Can you say amen? amen. We need to be humble and realize who we are in relation to whom God is. Matthew 24, verses 25 and 26, it says, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Friends, he says this because people in our day and age, we, but we see a sign, we see a wonder, and we just fall into it. Wow. And we'll tell people, Don't you tell me that I didn't feel something. I know what I felt. Uh -huh. I hear people say it too often times. I know what I felt. Well, hold on a second. If what you felt isn't biblical, then maybe you felt something that wasn't from God. Isn't that right? We need to be careful. Number eight. It says the Father will be with Jesus at His second coming. Amen? You say, well, how do we know that? Well, in Matthew 26 and verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of what? Power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, if he's sitting on the right hand of power, who would be on the, in, in, in the middle? The Father. Can you see the man? No doubt about that, friends. Yes, the Father will be with Jesus at His second coming. Number nine, Christ's coming is going to be glorious. Can you say amen? No doubt about it. Mark 8 and verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You see, friends, when Jesus Christ came the first time, he didn't come in all of his glory. Can you say amen? When Jesus Christ came the first time, he wasn't, he wasn't decked, so to speak, in all of His heavenly glory. If He would have, all of humanity would have died in His presence. Because sin is combustible material. Can you say amen? It's a combustible material. So no doubt about it, friends, Jesus Christ, when He comes back the second time, He's coming back in all of His power, in all of His glory, with all of the holy angels with Him. And friends, when He comes back, there's going to be a judgment. Which brings us to our next point. Point number 10. Christ's coming is climactic. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 says this. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. What did I tell you? Sin is a combustible material. Yes. Amen. When Jesus comes back in all of His power and all of His glory, friends, everyone who has sin in their lives, 
and who has not surrendered that sin to Jesus Christ, they will burn at His presence. They will be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. See, and it won't be God's fault that you're destroyed. It will be our own fault. I have people say all the time, why would God do such a thing? Well, hold on a second. He's given us every opportunity to surrender. Can you say amen? amen? He's told us what would happen in the end from the beginning. He's given us all the evidences of His existence. He's even worked mightily in our lives. Whether we, would not, whether we want, would choose to acknowledge it or not, God is working in all of our lives. And so, friends, if we choose not to give our life to Him, when He comes back in all that power and all of His glory, it will be our own fault if we end up burning at His appearing. You see, friends, but I, I believe and I trust that if we will put our faith in Jesus, that His Word will do exactly what His Word said it would do, and that we will rise to meet Him in the air, we will be transformed, as, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, that this mortal shall put on immortality. Yes. Amen? Amen? This corruption shall put on incorruption. Yes. Amen? Amen? Friends, I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus Christ will come back and get all of His children and take us with Him. Matthew 24, verse 36 says, But of the day and hour knoweth how many men? No man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You see, God has a time where He draws the line in the sand and He says, that's it. You read Revelation, last few chapters there, and you will see in the last few chapters of Revelation that God pans out a final time when He draws the line and says, let the just be just still. Let the holy be holy still. But let him which is filthy be filthy still. Let he that is unrighteous be unrighteous still. Judgment is pronounced upon all of those, whether they have accepted him or not accepted him. And the judgment is sealed. It's final. Friends, we're going to be studying that more as we look at the seven last plagues coming up a uh, couple of weeks from now. We'll study that together. But we know that no man knows the hour or day. You know, that every year there's date setters out there. They say that Jesus Christ is going to be coming back. I think it was somebody even this month. I think it was like May 22nd or something. There's people out there saying He's going to be coming back May 22nd and all this. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ it will come back when the gospel goes to all the world. Can you say amen? amen? That's what He says. And we don't know when that is. Amen? There's all these people nowadays. That they, they, they study the Bible. They get all these numbers together and they don't even know what half of them are. And they... They, they put together their own ideology of, about something and they say that that's when Jesus is going to come back. Oh, friends, don't believe it because the Bible is clear. No man knows the hour or the day. Now, you may be saying, but what about Christ coming as a thief? After all, Dakota, your presentation is titled Thief in the Night. You know, the Bible does say that Jesus Christ is going to come back as a thief. Isn't that right? Yes. But what does that mean? Does that mean because some people like Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins and many of the other people who believe in this secret silent rapture thing, they see the thief and they think, well, what does a thief do? And what they think is they think that Jesus is going to come back and He's going to snatch them out of the world like a thief would, something from your house, and that's it. But what did we just learn? We just learned that's not right. Amen? We just learned that every eye is going to see Him, every knee is going to bow, every tongue will confess, no doubt about that. So if that's not true then how do we explain the Scriptures in the Bible that refer to Jesus Christ coming back as a thief? How many of you want to know the truth of that? Amen? Amen? All right, let, let's look at it. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, notice what he's saying, if you will not watch, I will come on thee as a what? As a thief. And thou shalt not know what, what's that word? hour I will come upon thee. Now I want you to notice in all of these texts that we're about to go through, Jesus, when He's speaking to His coming as a thief, He's referring to time. Are you with me? He's referring to time. So let's, let's catch this as we go through this. Matthew 24, verse 42. He says, Watch therefore, for you know not what... What's that word? Hour. hour your Lord doth come. It says, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He says, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour, there it is again, as you think not the Son of Man cometh. 
So in all of these texts, we're seeing Jesus is referencing, to, talking about a thief in the night. He's referencing time. Can you say amen? He's talking about time. You will not know what hour your Lord doth come. It's simple, friends. So many people get these scriptures confused. Is Jesus a thief? Is he like, is he going to come around and steal us? Like, take your children. Take your wife. Let me take this. Is that, is that how Jesus is going to come? Do this. We've done made that very clear. We've showed that every eye is going to see him. He's going to come back with all of the holy angels. Amen? Father's going to be with him. He's going to blow the trumpet of God. Nothing's going to be secret and silent about his second coming. So notice in all of these scriptures, Christ coming as a thief refers not to how he comes, but when he comes. Are you with me? Yes. Check this out. Do you know... Now, think. Remember what I said? Think. Think about this. Do you know how a thief comes? Do this right here. We all know how a thief comes, don't we? When, when you, let's say a thief came, and you walked through your house, and you know how thieves work. I'm sure you, you guys have seen enough to know in your lifetime how thieves work. When you come in your house... Do you expect everything to be nice and neat and in order? And Do this right here. No. See, a thief's going to be in and out as quick as they can, and they're trying to search as fast as they can to find any valuables so they can get out as quickly as they can. Isn't that right? We know how a thief comes, but that's not what Jesus is referencing here. He's not referencing how a thief comes. He's referencing to when a thief comes. We know how a thief comes, but do we know when? a thief will come. We don't know that, do we? So what he's saying, watch therefore, for if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up into. Can you say amen? So friends, that's what Jesus is referencing here. He's not referencing that he's going to come back and snatch his children away and like, like a thief would and then there you have it, now you're left bare for seven years of tribulation. Ah, 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 ah. That's not the God I worship. That's not what my Bible teaches me. He says He's going to come and everybody will see Him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. No doubt about that. So, we got another question we have to deal with. What about the expression, one taken and another left? How many of you have read that in the Bible? Right? I think it's in Luke chapter 17. I have so many Christians come up to me and say, right here, Dakota. It says that one will be taken and the other shall be left. Let, let's take a look at this scripture and let's see. This, they, they go to these scriptures and they say, this is how we get the understanding of the secret silent rapture because of Luke 17. Let's read it together. Verse 34. I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Now let's just stop for a moment. Let's just stop for a moment. A lot of people even go on to teach that this is referencing homosexuality. This is not referencing homosexuality. Can you say amen to that? This is how we know that's not referencing homosexuality because some people are going to believe that this is saying that he's going to take one to heaven. Well, that would be against his word. Isn't that right? That would be dichotomous from his word. And God is not a dichotomous God. He is a synonymous God. So check this out. I tell you that two, there shall be two men in one bed. When you study the, the, the actual translation of this and you study the history context of this... That bed that it's referring to is not referring to a literal bed that you and I would lay down in. This is referring to a grave. Can you say amen? Are there going to be several, are there going to be two parties in the kingdom? Of, are there going to be two parties in the last days? Let's put it that way. Is there going to be a party that makes it? Yes or no? Is there going to be a party that doesn't make it? Yes, that's true. So here's the thing. This is what God is, 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 is trying to explain to them. He's saying, look, there's going to be two parties. One's going to be taken, another's going to be left. Now, He's saying here that there will be two men in one bed. In the sense that you look at the concept of this, bed in the Bible was a symbol of the grave. It was a symbol of the grave. Are there going to be people that have died, perhaps, and they're laying on top of one another? Isn't that right? Look at all the wars and all the things that's happened. No doubt about it. And he's saying that there's going to be two parties. One's going to make it, one's not going to make it. Isn't that right? No doubt about it. He goes on to say this. Two women shall be grinding together... You know, working, doing the toil of the day. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be what? Left. Okay, well, let's go on. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Now, most people would stop there, and they go, right there, there you have it, secret, silent rapture. That's not what the Bible says. 
Let's, let's continue on reading so that we get a proper context of this. Amen? Look at what it goes on to say here. They answered. I love his disciples. You know, they're, they're always asking pretty good questions. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? In other words, where are they going to be taken? Where are they going to be left? What's going on here? Notice what he says. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, are you ready to get the Bible answer for this? Revelation chapter 19. When you go to Revelation chapter 19, you read what's referred to as the great supper of God. The great what? The great supper of God. Or the supper of the great God, as some versions say. Let's go, let's see here. This is referencing how the destruction of the wicked, the wicked is going to be destroyed. So let's begin, let's pick this up, Revelation 19, and let's, let's pick this up in verse 16. So this is referencing Jesus coming back in the clouds, His second coming. It says, and... Um, Oh, let's, let's pick it up verse 15, rather. It says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that which he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of, he says, he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath his ve- on his vesture his name, on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Notice, this is referencing the second coming of Jesus. Are you with me? What did the Bible just say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, what happened to the wicked at the appearing of Jesus? That they would be destroyed by the brightness of His what? Coming. So the wicked's going to be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. They're going to drop dead, no doubt. It says, right here, it goes on to say here, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying unto the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Verse 18, That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Are you with me? Now, what is he saying is going to eat their flesh, the wicked's flesh? The fowls of the air. When Jesus answered this question, what did he say? They said, where, Lord, where are they going to be? He said, wheresoever the body is, speaking of their body that dropped dead, that's left over, there will the eagles be gathered together. Better believe it. This is referencing the supper of the great God how the wicked is going to have their bodies feasted on by the fowls of the air after the second coming. Are you with me? Now, that's that's how you understand Luke 17. I hope that made sense to everyone. Now let's look at the seven years of tribulation for a moment. You see, in the the Left Behind series, uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, when they wrote this, they go on to write it that Jesus, you know, he secret silently raptures and catches them up out of the way, poofs them out of the way, And then all of a sudden, all the rest of the people that are left behind are left behind for seven horrible years of tribulation. Seven horrible years of tribulation. And they go on to show in this movie and in this this book series that this interesting man by the name of Nikolai Carpathia comes along and he is the Antichrist. And he comes along and he has a mark that he's wanting everyone to receive of 666, this mark in their in their forehead and in their right hand. And they say that everyone that's left behind for the seven horrible years of tribulation, that's their second chance. Are you with me? That's their second chance. Now catch catch the term. And that they will have those seven years to get right with God, they will have to go through the tribulation. And have mercy. I remember when I was a kid, I would go to church I'm sorry if I'm passionate about this, but man, I just get fired up thinking of all the people that's being deceived by these pastors nowadays. They, 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 they get out there and they tell, they tell their congregations, Revelation chapter 1 through 4, you need to read and know it. But Revelation chapter 5 all the way to chapter 22, don't worry about it. They say, don't study it. And they say, well, why, pastor? He says, because we won't be here. Church is going to be raptured away. We're going to be caught up. We won't go through the tribulation, 
because we're going to be raptured out of here. <laughs> well, I, all I have to say for all those pastors that believe that and teach that, show me where it says that in the Bible. I thought my God saves us through the tribulation. Amen? My God is so powerful, He doesn't just poof us away from the tribulation. He saves us through the tribulation. What did Jesus do? Did He, did he poof Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Did He go, let me just take you fellas, poof. Is that what He did? Uh-uh. He didn't poof them out of there. He went through that fiery furnace with them, and they came out conquerors. Friends, the only thing that was burned off of them was the ropes that tied them. It's powerful. He was with them through the tribulation. Can you say amen? amen. God isn't going to rapture us out of here and poof us out of here so that we don't have to go through tribulation. Why didn't He do that for the disciples? Why is He showing partiality now? Does God show partiality? No. All of His children. He said, if you must follow me, you will suffer persecution. Just read, read, read the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. You know, they call them the Beatitudes because they're the attitudes you should be. Amen? You go read the Beatitudes. The last two spoken of, he says, you will suffer persecution if you follow me. So, but, but, but the churches today, they don't want none of that persecution. So they say, we're going to be raptured out of here. We won't have to worry about it. So don't read the revelation of Jesus Christ. Have mercy. Have mercy. I've never in my life seen so many people, too, that are thankful that they don't have to study the book of Revelation. And I bring it out and talk to people, they say, oh, I don't, I don't study that book of Revelation. Why? We're not going to be here anyways. Come on. That sounds just like a deception of the devil, doesn't it? To get you not to study the Word of God. Oh, friends. You see, where they get this seven years of tribulation from, the Antichrist created this teaching, by the way. I'm going to prove it to you coming up. You've got to stick with us. I'm going to prove to you who the Antichrist is and show you exactly how they came up with this teaching. But the Antichrist made this teaching of the seven years of tribulation. What they did is they went into Daniel chapter 9, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Now, I don't expect you to understand what I'm, what I'm showing here on the screen, but this is the chart of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. I will take you through a study on this later. But notice, you have seven years of tribulation, right? That's what they teach. They go into Daniel chapter 9, which, by the way, is a prophecy all about Jesus. And they say that this prophecy in that last seven years is not about Jesus. It's about the Antichrist. What? Where are they getting this from? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But guess who created the teaching? The Antichrist. And I'm going to show you exactly how they did. What they did is that back in the day... During the Dark Age time period, the Antichrist was getting exposed. People started to realize who the Antichrist was, and people were teaching who the Antichrist was, and so the Antichrist had to counter what was going on. And so what they did, they said, we've got to get attention off of us. So they said, we're going to tell everyone that this seven years is actually a prophecy of the Antichrist, and we're going to say it's way on up in the future. And to this day... People are buying into this teaching that was created back in the 1500s. Have mercy. Have mercy. This prophecy is all about Jesus, friends. There is no seven years of tribulation in the Bible whatsoever. And I challenge any minister on Facebook, any minister that's here today, anybody that would like to share that with me, I really would love to see it. I'm not being agitatious. I'm just saying I really would love to see it. I have searched until I'm blue in the face to try to find a seven-year tribulation because I was taught about the seven-year tribulation growing up and when I searched in my Bible to try to find the seven years of tribulation, I didn't find it anywhere in my Bible. It was nowhere. And friends, I want to encourage you, if you're going to a church that teaches about the seven years of tribulation, start looking somewhere else. I tell you this out of love. Because, friends, this is a mass deception. So why would the Antichrist come up with this seven-year tribulation left behind teaching? Well, friends, it's simple. Really, it's simple. You see, the idea goes like this. I remember when I was a kid and I learned about this teaching. They tell us that those that are left behind have to go through the seven years of tribulation and that that's their second chance. That if 
they accept the mark of the beast in that seven years of tribulation, well then, guess what? They won't have any part with God in the kingdom. But if they don't accept the mark of the beast during that seven years of tribulation, and they persevere through that tribulation, well then God will then let them come into His kingdom. Well, hold on a second. When I was a kid, I'll never forget when I heard this, I thought to myself, what do I get right now? Why do I want to live for God now? Are you with me? Are you seeing the dangers of this? And there's people in the church today, they won't admit it, but I know they're thinking it. I thought it. I'm being honest with you. I, I thought, I'm sitting there going, well, why in the world would anyone want to get right now? I mean, if you've got a second chance, I mean, hey, you just live how you want to live, do what you want to do. You don't make it in the secret silent rapture. That's okay. I'll know then that you're real, God, and I'll know then that, that you mean business, and I'll get right with you during that seven years. <laughs> but friends, the problem is there's no such thing in the Bible. And the devil is getting billions of Christians to believe in this. And the problem is, is that there's a lot of people that has went to their grave believing in this message, teaching this message. Friends, I'm glad I'm not their judge, amen? We are talking about life and death here. There's too much at stake to be putting our trust into men, as I said. And so if the devil can believe you to get, get you to believe into a second chance, that you get a second chance, he's got you. Because when Jesus really does come back in all of his power and all of his glory, guess what happens to the wicked then? Destroyed. There ain't no second chance. Our second chance was at Calvary's cross. That was our second chance. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross for you and me, that was mine and yours, second chance. The Bible doesn't say that wait, salvation will come to those who wait. No. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. We don't have time to be wasting. We must give our life to Jesus every single day. Surrender to Him every single day. Back in 1912, one of the greatest vessels to ever set sail, that was the most anticipated vessel to set sail, was the great Titanic. Isn't that right? This great vessel was about to set sail April 12th, 1912. April 11th of 1912, there was many boats that were coming in the harbor. And they were warning. They sent six warning messages. I'm sorry, seven warning messages. I think it was six or seven. It doesn't matter. They sent about six warning messages. To, it, was, it was six. Now I remember. I'm sorry. So many. So many messages that were sent to them. They sent six warning messages to the Titanic, warning them that there were icebergs ahead in the path that they had planned to go all the way across the Atlantic into the New York. The Titanic received these messages. And what do you think happened? They ignored them. April 12th, they began to set sail. And before they set sail out of the harbor, they received another five messages. That there were icebergs ahead. The next day, the 13th rolls around. And guess what happened? Another three messages comes along saying that there's icebergs ahead by neighboring ships passing by, telling them they need to take a detour to get around these icebergs. What happened? Well, you know the story. It was April 14th, 1912, the last day before they hit the icebergs. They received seven messages that day that there were icebergs dead ahead and they needed to detour. But because of all the ruckus that was made about this great unsinkable ship, people really be believed that this boat could never be sank. The captain himself, Captain Smith, gets in front of a big audience and he says, not even God himself could sink this ship. God didn't have to, an iceberg did. As he gets up 
And he tells the, uh, tells the audience, not even God himself could sink this ship. All of the millionaires and the rich people and all the people standing by that was ready to get on this board of this ship, they were so trusting into the message that this captain had given them. They said they'd built six compartments that even if they did hit, have, have, a, have a, 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 uh, an insertion in the boat to where it would cause the water to come in, that they would have plenty of compartments that no way this boat could be sunk. Well, what happened was that all the millionaires and all the people that were on this boat, after they hit the icebergs, the message went out that the ship is going down. Before they actually hit, there was a man who was setting up on the crow's nest. They told him, give us those binoculars. You don't need those binoculars. We'll take those. But he stayed up in his position. And when he saw the icebergs, after the fog had cleared, he saw the icebergs, he yelled out, icebergs dead ahead. And when they started to turn the boat, because they didn't take heed to the warnings ahead of time, it was too late. The icebergs was too big and too thick for them to turn away from. The boat strikes the icebergs. And what happened was that, friends, they received word from the men downstairs. There was men all in these rooms downstairs, people that when the water gushed in, the water was so massive and so strong that they couldn't open their doors and they drowned But as the water was rising up in the boat and it was starting to turn and capsize, they realized that this boat is going down and the unsinkable ship is about to sink. The captain himself then sends out a word and says, listen, he tells all the people, all the millionaires and billionaires, he says, hey, listen, this boat is going down. You need to get off. Get in the lifeboat. So they begin to prepare women and children to get in the lifeboat first. But the millionaires and the people that, are, that were on board of that ship, they said, no, you're joking. This boat isn't really going down. It can't sink. There was about 16 or so boats, lifeboats that were on board, and about eight or so of those boats were left over. Only half of those boats got filled. The rest of them could have been filled, but the people wouldn't get in them. They refused. Because they believed a message that was false. They believed that that boat was really unsinkable. So 1914, 1912, the great Titanic sank into the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Friends, we've been saying for years that Jesus Christ is coming back. Isn't that right? We've been saying for years that Jesus Christ is coming again. But just like those people on the Titanic, we have bought into a message where some of us even don't even believe He's actually coming anymore. And we show it and we prove that with our lives. We're not getting in the boats when this ship of this world that God has created is sinking, we need to be getting in the lifeboat. We need to be getting in Jesus Christ. Amen? He is our ark. He is our lifeboat. But so many people nowadays aren't following the message. They're not believing the message. Instead, friends, they're believing in an unsinkable ship. They're believing that this old terrible world, this old sinful, wicked world, is never really going to come to an end. Friends, I want to submit to you that one of the greatest decisions you could ever make is to take Jesus' warning serious. He says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the coming of the Son of Man be. Give your life to Jesus, friends. How many of you say, You know what? I want to be ready for His soon return. I want to rededicate myself. Amen? I'm with you. We all need to be ready. Let's have a word of prayer.
Father in heaven, we want to be ready for your word. We want to be ready to have your word in our hearts and our minds. We want to be ready, Lord, to receive of all of the knowledge and all the wisdom that you have to impart to us. That we will be better prepared for your soon return. Lord, we know we're living in the last days. We don't have much time left. So, Father, please, change us. We can't change ourselves, Lord. Only you can do it. So, Father, we ask of you to change our hearts and our minds. Help us to hate sin and loathe it as you do. And to love righteousness and holiness as you do. Father, help us, Lord, to be ready for your soon return. Because you know, God, that so many are not yet ready. And help us, Lord, to help others to be ready. That we will go forth witnessing and sharing the matchless, beautiful charms of your son Jesus with the rest of the world. We thank you, Lord, for your word that we've studied tonight. And we ask you, Lord, to brand it upon our hearts and our minds that we may never forget it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for coming tonight.